I'm Jimmy Lewis with Dirt Bike Test, and today we're going to talk about KTM's twin cylinder bikes. These are the 1090 specifically. We'll talk a little bit about the 1190 that I have a lot of experience with, and I'm relying on my history on the 950, which I have a ton of time on. So commonly I get asked, Jimmy, what do you think about these bikes? Which is the best bike? And that's a discussion for another time. We're going to talk about using these bikes sort of in an adventure touring context. Um, kind of a sporty adventure touring context because literally I cannot take off riding down the road without looking at the dirt roads and largely going there. So some of the questions are, what do you do to modify your bike? Um, why do you modify it? And, and how does it work? And so luckily I do have 1190 and a 1090 and I call my 1190 my street bike or my more when I'm on the street and my 1090 I goof around with a little bit more in the dirt. And there's a couple reasons for that. And number one is the biggest thing that I notice on the 1090s, it feels about 40 to 50 pounds lighter when you're riding it. It's just a little more agile package. And then so building on that, here's some of the stuff I do to modify the bike for my personal needs. Um, number one, and I'm gonna kind of start at the front of the bike and work my way back. Number one, no matter what, it's how you're connected to the ground. And I'm gonna talk about the tires at the very end. Um, I use Kenda big block tires, but I also do something that's kind of unique. I run smaller rims than st stock. Um, my front rim is about a half inch more narrow. My rear rim is about an inch more um, narrow. And I use W wheels. Um, they build um, a, basically a custom wheel set based off of the stock hub. They do a really nice coating on it. And then I laced it up to black uh, Excel rims. The, and they're with heavy duty spokes and it's a really tight wheel package. In fact, since I put this on, I haven't even had to adjust the spokes. They've all stayed really nice. So um, that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, mounted onto those wheels, I have Galfer rotors and I run Galfer pads. Um, in fact, I think the stock rotors are actually made by Galfer. Um, these ones have a little bit of a different shape and I feel a little bit more control at the lever with these um, rotors in this combination setup and I'm really big on brakes so it's it's a little difference it's not like a huge change but it's something that I notice and I like and I would recommend it if you're looking for better kind of braking performance my suspension on my 1090 is stock 100% completely stock I've had this, the components serviced after about uh, probably about 40 hours of riding um, I had somebody go through um, George at ESP suspension went through and um, basically serviced my stuff so it's fresh and it actually kind of felt a little bit better after that. I don't feel the need to go to all the stiffer springs and stuff that a lot of people are doing and one thing that is another big advantage between the 1090 and the 1190 is the fact that 1090 has a PDS rear shock and that extra damping that PDS system gives is huge and I'm actually trying to get my 1190 modified so that I can have that shock or I'm going to try to get my hands on a 1090 shock for that bike. As we kind of work our way um, up, I also run Baja Designs um, lights. These are the Squadron Pros. The light here, um, I have different lenses on, um, on the front. One has a uh, kind of a diffused reflector and the other one's more of a of a you know pencilized beam and these are activated through a little button here so that I can turn them on anytime I want so I run them during the daytime and then at night it makes all the difference in the world um, just to be able to see what's really right out in front of you um, and then we start working our way up onto the bike I run this uh, moto pockets pad up here just kind of carry my little things like a garage door opener and stuff uh, the cool thing about the the windscreen on these is they're you're able to a kind of adjust them and move them down and this thing kind of gets in the way when it's there but I tuck it in there because I usually don't have there's registration papers and stuff in there and I can move things around um, on the handlebar we have kind of a complex setup and I spent a lot of time working around up here because this is how you control your motorcycle um, the KTM is difficult to replace grips on because it's fly by wire and they have a very unique grip setup. Luckily, they're not too big of a diameter. I prefer a very small diameter grip. So I'm getting away with the stock uh, grips at the moment. I have mounted them onto flex handlebars. 
And if you know me, you know my wrists aren't all that good. So anything I can do to reduce the impacts that go into my wrists, uh, big advantage. Um, all you have to do is tap on the handlebars like this and you will notice the difference. They have some suspension built into them. Um, I don't know how much they actually reduce vibration, uh, but that's another thing that people say that they do. I find just the impact absorption. And then I set them up kind of different based on the bike. I have my red elastomers in here. Sometimes I go softer, sometimes I go harder, depending on the thing. It's something you can tune. And then with that, you can kind of tune the angle of the bar as well. Um, I run a 14 degree sweep on my adventure bikes. Usually on my dirt bikes, I run 12, um, just to kind of give you an idea of that. It's mounted on top of a BRP mount with a Scott steering stabilizer. So I've removed the stock steering damper thing that doesn't really do much. And actually it kind of fights me and put one on that allows the bike to valve back to center freely. Um, the Scott's damper is highly tunable. So I don't have very much low speed in it, so I don't really feel it. But when the handlebars get hit and it goes, you know, that's when the Scott Stamper really comes into play. So when you hit a rock or some kind of a rut catches and wants to turn the bike, um, it lightens up or it actually stiffens up and then makes the steering, you know, stiffen and then, but it still remains light when I'm riding. Uh, and then with that comes some bar rise. I think it's about three quarters of an inch is the standard amount of uh, rise that you get with your, your BRP mount and your Scott steering stabilizer when it's essentially sub-mounted. And then we, we look at that and on one of these, this is how picky I am, on one of these bikes I actually had the BRP mount milled down and dropped everything down a little bit back, lower. And then I you know, used the standard um, height flex bar they make another lower bar and then I was able to kind of manipulate it. So basically my two different bikes have slightly different rises in them and I notice it and I feel it, but that's how picky I get with this kind of stuff. I don't know if you'll necessarily be that picky. Most people think they need taller bars, but I am not really like that because taller bars tend to start pushing you back and I want to stay forward on the motorcycle. Um, I'm running the uh, different mirrors. These are the double take mirrors and they're really nice because just watch this. Now my mirror is out of the way and I no longer need it. And most of the time when I'm riding, I have my Trail Tech Voyager Pro on here. Um, I really like this thing, A, for buddy tracking, but you got to make sure all your buddies have a Voyager Pro also so you can see where everybody's at. And then it has something called perspective GPS, which is really neat. And it's essentially like taking the earth and turning it at a little bit of an angle as opposed to looking straight down on top of it. So when you're at na navigating and looking to see where you want to go, um, that's kind of a cool feature as well. Um, and the Voyager Pro is very connected. I'm still learning how to connect it, all the ways you can connect, connect it to your phone, um, to your headsets, to, you know, to your passenger's headset. There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do with that. Um, I kind of use it just to tell me where I've gone or maybe find a new trail. And then we start moving our way back on the motorcycle. Underneath here, you don't see it, is a Rottweiler intake. And it's basically a big giant air filter that replaces the air box. And if there's one complaint I hear from a lot of people, it's like, oh, the 1090 is a little lackluster in power. It just doesn't have the power of my 1190. I agree with you. If you want some of that back, the Rottweiler intake will give it back to you. Um, it's a little bit more noisy. It makes the bike feel like it has more torque. It gives it a smoother kind of pull and everything. And you're never going to get rid of that little bit of delay that they've built into the fly-by-wire system off the bottom. Um, we've tried a bunch of different things, but essentially I'm pretty sure it's something they're doing for emissions. But once you're riding and just the throttle response and the torque and the pull of just opening up the air box, it's like all of a sudden it doesn't go and suffocate for a little while when you start rolling the bike on. Uh, so a really good improvement for power without really making the bike noisy or really loud. It just gives it some character when you roll that throttle on. Um, this is probably the one I get the most flack for is I run a tall seat on my bike. This is a seat concepts, tall seat. And number one, it's super comfortable. There's extra foam in here, which is really nice, but they're like, Jimmy, 
you got short legs, you can't even touch the ground. It's like, I don't ride with my feet on the ground. So uh, I'm not really worried about, you know, stopping and getting both feet on the ground. I can't do it. I have to pick a side and put one foot down. But what this does is it actually increases the distance from the foot peg to the top of the seat. So when I'm sitting down, I'm not so crunched up and I don't get stuck in this pocket that happens with the stock seat. So this seat actually gets switched between my bikes a lot. That's actually lucky that it's real easy just to do it the key because it is way more comfortable for me to ride. And I really do like it. The, the grip is excellent, you know, when you're starting to do more aggressive stuff. And the only time I really don't like this seat is when I'm doing demonstrations or trying to make the bike do pivot turns or over logs where I really need to put my feet down. But 99% of the time, I really like the big tall seat. And then we get to foot pegs. And since this is how I control my motorcycle is through the foot pegs, it's really important on the grip the foot peg has and also the position of the foot peg. So there's a couple things here. I've been going between the Fast Company Flex foot peg and also the IMS um, Rally, I think it's called the Rally Pro foot peg. And both of those foot pegs are a lot wider than stock and by wider I mean width this way and that gives you more leverage on the bike. Uh, the disadvantage is it doesn't necessarily fit between rocks and stuff but it's not that much and in reality I'm not taking the bike through rocks like that too much but it gives me more leverage to maneuver and control the bike and then I want a lot of grip. The Fast Company peg actually sits down a little bit lower so it also increases the seat to foot peg distance and so I like it for that reason. I think the IMS peg gives my foot a better bite and grip. So I'm li literally torn between those two pegs. They're, they're really, um, and then there's some damping characters and qualities to the Fast Company peg. I think the sole of my boot does as much as that does. Um, but at the end of the day, especially on a real dirt bike, you do notice that damping. On the adventure bike, ah, not so much. So, um, the foot pegs are so important for controlling it, um, controlling the motorcycle. It's, they're, 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 it's a modification and KTM makes some really nice rally foot pegs that they, they're basically off their rally bikes that bolt onto these. So there's a lot of different options there and I think it's a really good modification. As we start moving towards the back, we get into the luggage um, zone. And of course, on these bikes, I'm usually carrying something, whether it's just a jacket or some stuff if I'm you know, riding to go, go for a run or whatever and I have my gear inside here. Most of the time, I have the Wolfman soft bags on here. It's the bike, I have the Touratech um, pannier mounts on it and these bolt right onto it. And there's actually a newer system that I'm gonna get pretty soon that's kind of a modular system that um, will allow you to do a lot of different luggage carrying things but these are nice because they're soft if your leg hits them or something like that it's not going to be as, as dramatic as when you hit an aluminum pannier um, so 90 percent of the time these stay on here there are times though when i'm going to go camping or i'm going to go on a longer ride and i want to take more stuff then i start switching over to the you know the aluminum panniers and then i can actually start stacking stuff up on top a little bit easier and then use the top rack this is also a tour tech top rack that has you know different ways to bungee mount and hook things up. Uh, on this bike, since I don't really ever ride double on this one, I've removed the passenger foot pegs. Uh, I don't feel like I need them, uh, and they kind of they kind of get in the way. It just opens up some space back there for moving around on the bike. And super important for the KTM's is a little extra fuel. And so I run this Camel ADV tank, adds six liters, which is uh, a little over a gallon and it makes a big difference in getting me where I need to go. And then we're going to talk about tires. Um, for me, one of the most important things you can do on your adventure bike is realize that traction is critical. I ride on the dirt a lot. I need an open block knobby. Um, I run the Kenda Big Blocks for a number of reasons. Um, number one, they support me <laughs> with my schools. So that's the disclaimer here. But uh, it's a really good, what I will call, all-around tire. I can take this bike and ride it as fast as I care to on the street, and then I still have really good off-road performance in the dirt. The Kenda is just super consistent. Um, 
like some of the other tires in the market. There's the TK, Continental TKC80, there's the Michelin Anarchy Wild 3, and then um, there's, there's a whole fleet of other ones, but the, the three that I just mentioned are probably the standouts in the field. Um, the one thing the Kenda really does well is like bump compliance. It's almost like you had your suspension revalved. It, it, on washboardy roads, it just works really well at just taking the, the bumps and kind of smoothing them out, where the Continental, I feel, is a little bit better on the street when you're just carving out turns and stuff. And the one thing the Michelin is really known for is getting really good um, mileage life out of them compared to the, the Continental and the Kenda. So they kind of each have a little bit of a strong point. Uh, I get probably, I go through two rears for every front is kind of the way it is. And I can get about, I roughly about 2,500 to 3,000 miles in the rear tire. And people say, well, that's not very much. But what's funny is when they get worn out, and I'll definitely make sure we show a picture of a really worn out tire that is still on my bike that I'm still riding. The knobs that are doing the work, the ones on the side are actually still good. So when the bike starts slipping or losing traction, it still has the ability to grab. But you think about it, that tire is kind of polished off in the center. It may not be as thick as some you know, true road going tires or what they call 50-50 tires, but it's still going to give you that much traction. So you have the, you know, you can run them down to they're pretty kind of bald and then you just start losing kind of braking performance. On the front, the knobs get cupped kind of towards the back a little bit, and that's when you have to start worrying about replacing them. So um, those are sort of my different mods that I've done to this bike. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you ask them in the uh, video comment section. We'll try to get back to you. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this, and we'll give you a whole lot more content on Dirt Bike Test in the near future.